Dustin, I want to thank you for the nice warm introduction and the Jane team for including me and allowing me to speak uh, to you all about this, what I believe is quite important topic that we don't get taught in school. I've been a, a Jane user for the last five years and an ambassador just for the last, just over a year, a year and a bit. And it's been a lovely community to interact with like-minded individuals, healthcare practitioners across the continent and some in uh, across the pond in, in Europe. So the topic today is personal finance as a healthcare professional. And as we all know, at least most of us, who probably a few of you maybe got a little primer on this uh, topic in school, we don't really learn it. I didn't learn it in my high school years. Didn't learn it in my undergrad years. Didn't learn it in my post-grad years. It's not until I exited the work, uh, the academic environment and entered the workforce when I was 23, 24 years old, that you really get slapped in the face in terms of how do I really manage my money? How do I set goals? How do I plan for retirement? And it's a daunting thing and sometimes quite overwhelming. So in that vein, since it's kind of overwhelming, I like to start with kind of a dad joke because I'm a sucker for dad joke, but I'm not a father. So here's a joke and you can write your, uh, your guess or your response in the chat there. Why did the scarecrow win an award? Because he's outstanding in his field. I know corny, but quite funny at the same time. So the agenda for today. First thing is why discuss personal finance? And I'll allude to it a little more as we get going. Things I wish I'd known, I wish I would have known when I exited the academic world and entered the workforce about 12 years ago. I'm a practicing physiotherapist here in Southern Ontario. So I kind of know what we get taught, what we don't get taught, and what we learn on the way. And then the budgeting aspect of it. Sometimes it's kind of a daunting process, but the importance of budgeting and what it lends to later on, creating financial goals. Kind of like you create SMART goals for your therapy, especially in uh, orthopedic rehab, we have individuals who have a knee injury. We set SMART goals for their recovery and their rehab process. Same thing with their own personal financial life. Drain reports I use on a daily and a weekly basis that really kind of make my life easier so I can get that return on time, which I'll speak to later. And inflation, a very hot topic button at the moment, as we all know, especially those who do grocery shopping for our households, the price of goods and services increasing despite the quality or the value not really being there and how it impacts your wealth. So with this, anything financial, I have to be very particular about what I say because I'm coming from this as an amateur. I do not have traditional education in anything I'm going to be speaking about. So it's all education in that respect. And I'll go through it further, but I didn't go to school for personal finance. I doubt there's any even programs on personal finance. So everything I've learned in the last 12 years has been either through trial and error, networking, a lot of mistakes, and a loss of money. So please don't take any of this to be construed as financial advice, because as you know, on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis, financial news changes like the wind. So what you take today might be quite different tomorrow and in five days' time. So why should we discuss it? And I don't think this hyperbole, but it may sound like that. It can and likely change the outlook of your life. Because in our society, money is the medium of which we obtain certain goods and services. And for me, money is the medium in which I obtain time freedom. And that is the opportunity to do what I want, when I want to do it, not because I need to do it. And there's a choice between that. So if you understand how money works, how to deploy it, how to allocate it, and how to use it, it's nothing but a tool for your goals. And I don't think money should be the end goal, but what it provides you be the end goal. And that's some sort of meaning or purpose. So why discuss it? And I should have started this first. I'm a physiotherapy, uh, a physiotherapist by trade, not a Canva designer. So please excuse maybe some of the rudimentary uh, slides that I have here. But if you look at the top left, this is from a few years back, but four years ago, it says the average Canadian owes about $73,000 in consumer debt. That's excluding your mortgage. Over 53% of Canadian households are $200 away of being bankrupt or insolvent. Our American neighbors, our American registrants here, $90,000 in US consumer debt. And that's from 2021. The middle right here is kind of hard to see, but it's describing a, a bar chart on how difficult it is to feed a family of four with groceries. And in 2016, it was 45% difficult across the board. But fast forward six years, that's jumped 13% or sorry, 12% to 
to 57% of people find it difficult to put household groceries on your table. And the last one came out recently, just over nine months ago, 61% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And if you delve deeper into the actual article, the surprising thing is 44% of individuals who earn over $100,000 are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, in my role as a physiotherapist and now a director of the clinic, I often get questions about, Robin, I need to earn more money. And that's one question or one um, part of the equation. It's a variable, meaning income coming in. But we rarely ask what is going out, meaning how much you spend. So with that last article, if you make over $100,000 in living paycheck to paycheck, and from by many standards in our profession, that's a decent salary. It's not an earning issue. It's a spending issue. And oftentimes we default to assume I need to make more money. We don't introspectively look at where our money is allocated or spent and more importantly, where our time is. And if you can increase the income by maintaining or decreasing your expenses, that net difference, that delta improves as you age. But unfortunately in our society, and the last couple of days is a good example of Prime Day, is that we spend in much in line with what we earn. So we might earn more, more money as we get older, but guess what? Our keeping up with the Joneses, our social comparison also goes up. We tend to spend more and buy more to make up or to fall in line with what's, who, what is around us and who is around us. So our difference, our delta doesn't change. We end up making more, we spend more, we have no net difference. So that's the challenge. So that's where personal finance comes in, but understanding where your money is allocated and how to really increase that net difference. So I was fortunate enough, this is when I was I think 23, 24 years old, my last unit uh, in physiotherapy school, my preceptor at the time, Margaret, and she may be on the call. If you are Margaret, thank you very much for this question. She asked me, Robin, how many clinicians do you know who are actively practicing over the age of 50, 55, or 60? And you don't have to say the number, but you can say the percentage. And you can, you can type this into the, the chat. If you're looking around you, especially in the realm of orthopedic physiotherapy, it could be all the same with massage therapy or chiropractic or osteopathy. I'm guessing it's not a lot. Prior to getting this question, I volunteered for about two years in my undergrad. I did about five units of, of physiotherapy placements. And I could probably think of five individuals who were practicing over the age of 50, 55. And if they're not practicing, what are they doing? Because your ability to earn is different depending on your profession. So the next logical step for many of us is, hey, I've done being an employee. I've done being a self-employed or sole proprietor. Now I want to open up my own clinic. So that's the next logical step. Some people and a few friends of mine have switched careers entirely. They've pivoted and they've gone to maybe pharmaceutical sales, medical device sales represents. Maybe they're doing adjudicators or adjusters for certain insurance companies. Some say, uh-uh, I'm done. Whether it's burnout through the pandemic, whether their partner, their spouse has another income and he, she, they have pulled away and said, I'm not going to be working, but they stop. And lastly, they might go into traditional academia, not so much the education I'm providing you today, but more of the traditional academic where they might go into research degrees. But here's the kicker, everyone. I think it's important to understand that your practicing years are finite. No one told me this when I was 25 years old that I'll likely not be practicing actively by the time I'm 45 or 50. Whereas if you consider other professions, whether they're accounts, accountants, lawyers, certain physicians, architects, financial advisors, they're practicing or working into their 50s, their 60s, their 70s, right? And guess what's gonna happen? What do you think is gonna happen in the next 20 years? Do you think the life expectancy is gonna go up or down in our society? More than likely, it's going to go up. So we start exiting the workforce at 55, and right now our average life expectancy, depending on the country, between, let's say, 79 and 82. In 20 years' time, it might be 85 to 90. So you're done working at a certain age, and you're living for a longer age. You have that difference that you have to pay for. So what are you doing with your money? If you can't earn it, where is it going? How are you allocating and how are you investing it? So why should you listen to me? Great question. As I mentioned, um, physiotherapist for the last 12 years in Southern Ontario. I moved here when I was five years old with my older brother and my parents um, and very much taught the immigrant lifestyle. And for those, this might be dating myself, but to those who have ever watched or listened to Russell Peters, that is my childhood. And I often joke with my parents 
as tough as it was, it really taught me a few things. Um, mom especially taught me the value of time at a young age. But in that upbringing, traditionally I can speak from experience, there was three professions I could pursue. Being a lawyer, doctor, or engineer. My brother, two years older than I, pursued an engineer degree, so I had either between a lawyer and a doctor, so I chose to pursue the path of being a physician. So I went to Queen's University, um, and then I made the switch right after my first year from life sciences, which is kind of pre-med, to my kin degree, kinesiology degree. And I truly loved that change, one of the more formidable decisions of my life, because it put me down the path of where I currently am. And then graduating with my bachelor's degree, mom said to me, hey, Robin, you don't have enough initials underneath your name. You need more. So I pursued my master's in physiotherapy with master, and I graduated in 2012. And then since then, I've been involved in the academic capacity, uh, tutoring in terms of clinical lab skills or theoretical skills in their program since 2012, so about 12 years. And I have to say, if I were to go back in time and kind of qualify for physiotherapy school, I don't think I'd make it in. I'm not intellectually gifted. I'm not especially bright. The individuals coming through school right now are so resourceful, intellectually gifted, and uh, thoughtful that I'm quite, I'm quite impressed with it. But they fall prey to an understanding of having one skill set that's this small, and you can't conflate this skill set into life in general. Because as you exit the academic world and enter the workforce, you might get hit in the face metaphorically with a whole bunch of things, and I don't think you're well equipped for it. And that was the emphasis for me to start this business, Financially Fulfilled Physio, to educate healthcare professionals how not to trade time for money and how money actually works. So things I wish I knew upon graduating. You're not entitled to anything. And I struggle with this, especially earlier on when I was an employee. I worked uh, a few, um, I don't know how long exactly, maybe a year or so. And I expected to be compensated in kind based on the tenure or the amount of time I spent there. I had no impact or thought about how much value am I providing to the owner of the clinic and understanding the way business works because I expected to get a raise each year because I was just there. And I realized, hey, if that person as the owner isn't making more money, how are they supposed to expect to pay me more money? So that's when I really thought, okay, in order to provide value, I have to, in order to get raises, I have to provide value. And it doesn't have to be monetary value in terms of making more money, but intangible things, whether it's the environment or the culture you behave, whether it's the number of reviews you bring in, or how good you are with your clients, the amount of referrals you have. So I, I encourage people, if you're starting out with your career and you're looking for some sort of compensation in kind over the years, look towards the value, not towards the tenure. And I think our society is well built on, hey, yours are service, you get more money for it. But you can have two different scenarios. You can have 20 years of service, or you have one year repeated 20 times. And oftentimes we have individuals who have worked one year, improved themselves for one year, but have had coasted or mailed it in and expected to be compensated in kind for individuals who've improved themselves every single year for 20 years. And they're different. For this, you work incredibly hard for your money. You deal with people's uh, issues on a daily basis. You work on your time management skills, your day in and day out. You have to earn an income based on the clinic, the location you are. You might do some virtual care, but no one's going to care for your money as much as you will. And you have to be important. You have, it's important to understand how to allocate it, how to entrust it, because money is a proxy of your time. You've allocated your time to earn a certain revenue. You cannot get that time back. So allocate that money um, importantly there. Educate yourself in personal finance and financial literacy and invest appropriately immediately. And this is the challenge because personal finance is a daunting, sometimes overwhelming concept. And oftentimes we'll hope things will work on the end or we'll push it for later and say, we'll figure it out later. You don't take the necessary or the requisite action now. And then you'll have something called regret. And that's something I'm fearful of. I do not want to have regret. So I try to have the best regret minimization decisions now so I don't have as much later on. And if I were to go back in time, I'd go back and say, oh, heck yeah, I've learned about personal finance and start investing as small as might be earlier on. Because guess what? When you start investing, you pay more attention to it. Less time on TikTok, less time on Instagram, more time on, more time on Yahoo Finance or Wealthsimple or Webull or Robin or whatever it is. But you pay more attention to it and your future self will thank you. Eliminate needless debt. And this is more of the concept of credit card, high interest debt, anything like over eight or 9%. Uh, 
Because unless you're earning eight or nine percent guaranteed verifiable on a daily basis, that debt is eroding your wealth. Set goals and do not compromise them. Just like we set SMART goals in rehab, I want my individual suffering an ACL to be able to ambulate in two weeks' time without gate aids. I said the same thing with my personal finance. For me, my big, hairy, ugly, audacious goal is in three years' time, I'm going to have the choice of wanting to work versus needing to work. So I'll be 40 years old, and I want to be technically retired and having that choice. I'm not going to compromise that. I'm still going to aim for 40. But if I miss, at least I set that goal that's audacious so I can be happy about that. Life is not fair. And depending where you are and depending on your circumstances, we've all gone through hardships and adversity. I think adversity, at least in my situation, has really taught me to be very grateful for what I have and make me work harder for things I want to achieve. But it's not going to be easy. Nothing worthwhile in life comes easy. And it's not going to be fair. So it's understanding in those valleys of despair to look for resources to help you, people to help you, parents to help you. And then what you do there really impacts how the troughs are. So do expect some challenges along the way. And here's a challenge. Here's a mental or mindset challenge. If I was given $1,000 when I was 25 years old and told to invest in stocks, real estate, or businesses, my first objection is like, no way. I wouldn't do it. But if you ask me at 25 years old, could I take another therapy-related course that costs $1,000? I'd do it no problem because I was familiar with the academic realm. It was less risky. I didn't want to take on any other burden I didn't know. But if I go back in time, I would learn more about these income-producing assets. Because guess what? For some of them, I don't have to physically be in a location to earn an income. In therapy, I do. So it frees up my time to pursue other interests. Budget. This invoked a big feeling of deprivation earlier on. It's kind of like when you're reading through certain conditions through your postgraduate school, your undergrad, sometimes you're like, ah, I feel like I have this condition, but I want to go through the diagnostic test because I don't want to reveal what it is because I don't want to deal with it. And it's kind of like equated to kind of budgeting. It's doing an introspective look as to where your money's going so you know where it's going so you can make changes. It was kind of like that blissful ignorance feeling, the thought of budgeting. But in like rehab or health professional, if you don't track certain outcome measures, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, how can you prove it? And for me, I created a budget and you can uh, think there'll be a follow-up email with some of these links there where you can use this either manually like I do on a regular basis or automated, which I can show you some resources, where on your left column, you have your actual budget roughly where you think you're gonna spend certain money. And let's say it's $200 to go watch or go to purchase X, Y, and Z kind of clothing. And at the end of the month, you say, oh, no, I spent $175, even though I budgeted $200, and your difference or your, your variance is $25. You actually see where it's going. So you can know where it's going, so you can make changes later on. And it's the difference between your income and your expenses. So for me, I'm fee-for-service, I'm self-employed, but for some individuals, you might have an employee-type income, but it's pretty stable for the most part. Then you might have side hustle income, whether it's your baking on the side, your Etsy store on the side, whatever it is. Or you might drive for Uber or DoorDash, and any other source of income that is kind of semi-variable, not semi, uh, semi-verifiable and consistent, then you can include that in your income category so you can see what you earn on a uh, monthly basis. And I'll include a couple, uh, at least one report I use on a bi-weekly basis that comes straight from Jane, and that's your product performance. So instead of going back every single day and seeing how many new assessments I saw, how many follow-ups I saw, how many X, Y, and Z I saw, I set my time frame up. I can pull it up and say, okay, I had 10 individuals who did this service, that service, that service. So the end of the two-week period when I submit my invoice, I have it there. It's already done for me. Oh, I think I'm frozen. Perfect. Yeah. Then you have your expenses. This is the second part of the budget. And there's three ways you can classify expenses. Traditionally, you'll have your fixed expenses. And depending where you are situated, it might be a mortgage. It might be a monthly rent. If you're lucky enough, you might be living like mom and dad, like I did originally, you may not have much there. Then you have loan payments. It could be your student loan. It could be your vehicle loan. It could be your credit card. Then you have property tax or insurance or your car. Then we have semi-variable ones. And this is pet food. This is groceries. These are utilities. And this is my uh, adopted, this is my girlfriend's dog, Fernie, uh, which is this reminds you of a pet food. So his food will change from uh, season to season, depending on how much he's how active he is. And yes, he's wearing a Jane uh, bandana there. And then variable, that's your entertainment. That's your gift. That's your clothing. We know holiday season, 
the variable might increase because you might be buying X, Y, and gifts for your friends and family. It might be summer season, you might be going on trips, maybe you're going to Paris to watch the Olympics. So it's important to set these up so you know where that's going. Because otherwise, seasonally, you might have some dead periods where there's not a lot of variable because you're on the grind. But then other periods are going up and down. So for me, what I generally do for clients, I say, look at your last three months. Don't look at just a month because a month's not a large enough snapshot because it could be a one-off month. Look at the last three months and get a rough estimate. It's just $100 you typically spend. Budget for $110, $120 because I can assure you based on inflation rates in a couple of years and not a couple of months, it might be that $110 or $120 amount. So two ways to do it. The automated approach is something I did originally. But I do like the aspect of manually putting things in because when I manually transcribe something, I feel the pain of inputting how much I spend on Starbucks or how many ABC pants from Lulu I wear. So you can use, you need a budget. There's a paid and a free version. You can use Pocketsmith, Monarch Money, Coho, and Waldi, or you can use the manual spreadsheet. And it doesn't have to be mine. You can just go type into Google or Bing and say uh, budget spreadsheet monthly, and you can find the first one there and use that yourself or Google Sheet. For me, I create a ritual around it, okay? Every Saturday morning when I'm not golfing, especially in the summertime, I'll sit down, usually eight o'clock, I'll bring up my last two weeks expenses, I'll get a nice warm uh, cup of black coffee and I'll knock it out for an hour. This helps me keep track of my monthly expenses so I don't have to wait at the end of the year and say, oh, where did I spend that money in July in Walmart? I can't remember that receipt, I don't know where that goes. So when I hand it off to my accountant, it makes his life easy, Kevin enjoys it. He hasn't charged me enough, uh, charged me more for it because I'm making his life easy. And I know accurately where my money has gone. And I can make the course correction as the year goes on based on my goals. So creating financial goals. I, I created this example based on the kind of old adage of having an American or Canadian dream. Some of us may have this or aspire to this, but I think it's a common thing for most of us. And it might not be for all of us. But for me, at age 20, my goal was to retire at age 55, somewhere warm, because I live in a, a colder climate uh, half the year, and I love to golf. So I want to be somewhere warm. But I wanted to live technically till age 80. That was kind of life expectancy, but able to provide for my family, my grandchildren, and my children. And I like to leave my two grandchildren with $50,000 in tuition. And to our Canadians out there, that might be seem like a decent amount. To our Americans, especially, that might feel like only one year of tuition because it's quite expensive relative to the same tuition up here. It's two year, four year program. It might differ quite a bit though, but it's 50,000 we'll say for uh, my, my heirs. Now, how do I create this? I know that I'm going to have 35 years until I retire. If I'm starting at 20 and retiring at 55, then I know from 55 to 80, that's 25 years of actual retirement. I can't earn income traditionally, but I need money in the bank so I can withdraw against for my lifestyle expenditures. And since I've budgeted correctly, I know on a yearly basis, I spend about $75,000 for my annual lifestyle. So I had these numbers because I've gone through the exercise. Now I have to set the goals. But if I break down these goals, the idea of retirement doesn't seem so daunting. You've taken a very challenging concept and distilled it or compartmentalized that into more achievable things. And anybody knows how mindset and kind of the brain works, Things are more tangible or easier to achieve. Things that are large and overwhelming, we dismiss typically, hard to tackle. So if you can break down those long-term goals into kind of monthly, annually, every couple of year chunks, you'll be able to achieve it more often. So how much money do you need or do I need to reach this goal? Don't let me scare you, but I'll need at least $2.3 million by the age of 55. And I'm not making $2 million a year not making anywhere close to that a year traditionally. And many of us can kind of empathize with that. So if at age 20, I initially invested $10,500. If I added $1,250 a month, so that's about $15,000 a year, at 7%, which is your net of fees, for 35 years, I would have $2.3 million. I'd hit my goal. And with the power of compound interest, which many of you will understand, if I let that money sit and not touch it or withdraw it, in 10 years' time, it would double. It go from $2.3 million to $4.8 million just in 10 years. So if you can hold on to it and invest well, that money can really grow. That's one of the reasons why, if you know Warren Buffett, he wasn't really a, a billionaire until his, I think, 70s. And then he started to exponentially increase his wealth because the power of compound interest. But the first objection I get when I present this is, hey, Robin, 
$1,250 is too much. And here's a little mindset shift. Don't tell me that it's too much because when you do so, you'll shut off your brain to possible options. Ask yourself instead, how can you afford it? Are you paying a little too much on your Amex bill? Do you have too much on your new Ford in terms of your car payments? Are you spending too much on prime shopping? First, take an introspective look on what you were allocating your money to and your time to before you tell me that 1250 is too much. So speaking of where you spend your time, these are three of the reports I use to buy back my time on a weekly and monthly basis. And thank you to Jane, because the previous program I worked on uh, prior to 2019 didn't have any of the reports, and I would spend hours charting. So Jane was uh, gracious enough to introduce phrases. And for me, it's orthopedic physiotherapy. So I spent maybe an hour or two hours one day a few years back and created a whole bunch of phrases that I typically use on a daily basis, depending on the assessment. I see, let's say, post-op ACL, then I can create that whole assessment, make some changes based on the client, but that saves me a whole bunch of time. So from working five days a week and doing an hour of charting at night, it saved me 50% of that time. So now I have an extra two and a half hours every week, which is 10 hours a, a month or 120 hours a year to allocate to different things. And you can, can you imagine what you can do with 120 extra hours a year? Then for me, it's also understanding where my clients are. I'm self-employed or fee-for-service. So I want to make sure my clients have a very uh, enjoyable experience with their, sometimes as their first time at rehab, sometimes their second or third. So it's in creating these touch points. And what I struggle with, and this is more of a personal issue, but you may also empathize with it, is oftentimes when I, let's say, have my caseload that changes, let's say people don't book back in or they fall off, I always assume introspectively that it's something I've done or something I've said. So I take it hard on myself. And I'm like, oh, what did I do that Joe isn't coming back? But then I make a point of getting on the phone, not an email. It's harder to ignore a phone call than an email. We know this. To call them on my Monday morning and say, okay, hey, Joe, this is Robin. I know uh, you canceled your appointment last week. I'm hoping things are going well with you. The goal is for my call is to see how you are so we can make progress on our rehab plan. My next thing I was going to work with you is to work on your plyometric jumping so you can get back to playing tennis. Uh, how do you feel about that? Oh, that's great, Robin. I was away. I was at the camp. I'll book in with you next week. Perfect. Here you go, Joe. Thanks so much. And these touch points make a difference. Ask yourself, when was the last time your GP called you on the phone and had a nice cordial conversation with you? Probably rare, right? Probably not a lot. But imagine if you had got that call, how that make you feel, right? And we know in rehab, your outlook and your outcome are directly tied. The better you think about your rehab or your progress, the more likely the better you're going to feel, just like the negative is also true. So that's where the patient last visit really comes in handy for me. And lastly is how I allocate my time. It's a finite, non-renewable resource. So every dollar I spend, every hour I spend can be spent a multitude of ways. And I have to ensure, at least for me, that it's allocated correctly. And I'm not looking for monetary return, meaning that every dollar I have to make sure I get an investment back on it. These are intangible, non-monetary things, fulfillment-wise. I know I spend about 12 to 16 hours a week golfing. I don't get paid to golf, I'm not good, but I enjoy it. So I'll allocate that time accordingly because it gives me purpose and fulfillment. Same with this. But clinically, what I'd use it for is, hey, I might be scheduled 40 hours a week, but if I'm only booked for 20 hours of that, that's 50% return of my time. Not a very good utilization for me. So I have to make sure if I'm only big 50%, what am I doing in those non-clinical treating hours? Am I finishing my notes? Am I pursuing other leads? Do I have a side hustle? Am I contacting my clients? Am I utilizing my time well? And clinically, you're probably going to use it more to gen re generate monetary return. But outside of that, are you spending way too much time scrolling on TikTok and numbing yourself on Instagram? Or are you using to pursue other goals you have? So clinically, this is where I use the hour scheduled hour book to get a nice quick snapshot of where my utilization is. So in the chat, this is the hot top button. If you don't mind, just type in what you think or how you would define inflation. I'll just pause and have a drink while you're doing that. Okay. So I didn't understand inflation because historically for, let's say from 2010 when I um, exited, or 2012 when I exited school till let's say 2020 for eight years, it stayed at two or 3%. I didn't feel really the effects. I know things were going up, but I couldn't really pinpoint, oh, it's gone up 10%. So 
academically, the definition of inflation is your decline in purchasing power of a given currency over a given time. So they look at it an average basket of goods that the average person would consume and see how those goods and, or services would change in price. And a good example here, for my Americans, it might be Dunkin' Donuts. For my Canadians, it might be Tim Hortons. Think about, many of us might not be as old uh, in terms of being alive in the 1970s, but if you are, if you could remember, think about your 333 milliliter or a couple ounces of coffee, okay? Black coffee. Back then it cost you 25 cents. Now you fast forward 50, 54 years, that same 333 milliliter ounce of coffee is costing you six times more. Now, is it because that coffee inherently has gotten six times better? I would argue against that, no. But it's because the dollar you're paying it with has lost purchasing power. It is worth less. A good example, case in point, for our homeowners who bought a home in 2019, and now in 2024, I think the average increase in the American uh, general real estate is up 51%, Canadians probably close to 60, 70, depending on the zone, is because your four walls have gotten marbles and gold on it? Is your roof inherently getting more valuable because it's got more shingles on it? No, okay? That same good is maybe previously decreased in value because the, uh, the roof's got wear, the walls, the paint's drying up, but it's gonna take a lot more of those dollars that are worth less to purchase the same thing. And that's a, like a silent tax because you're outputting your time, you're getting your return on your money, but the money isn't holding its value. You have to put more time into it to get the same amount. And time is finite. So that is the challenge. We feel squeezed. So let's go through a historical example. So my American friends will like this because it's gonna be in the imperial system. Canadians might not understand too well, but we can, we can go through it together. So 1960, the average um, gallon of milk, so roughly 3.78 liters was a dollar. Your eggs per dozen was 57 cents. Your bread per loaf was 45 cents and your bacon per pound for 54 grams, it's 59 cents. You fast forward 20 years, your milk doubled. Same 3.78 liters, same gallon, same volume is doubled in price. Your eggs have gone up by 50%. Your bacon has gone up for the same. Then you're looking at 20 years later, 2000s, milk has gone up, your eggs have gone up, your bread has gone up and they switched out bacon to ground beef, a little more affordable, but $2 a pound. Now, four years ago in 2020, milk gone up in value, your eggs have gone up in value, your bread has gone up in value, and your ground beef has gone up in value. Same unit or volume amount, 12 in a dozen, 454 grams in a pound, 3.7 years in a liter, but it's taking more of those dollars that are worth less to purchase it. That frankly stinks, right? You're getting, kind of eroded in terms of your purchasing power. And you'll have talk in financial news about inflation decreasing or called disinflation. It still means your prices are going up, but at a less steep of a value. Think about you driving a car, you're accelerating, that's inflation. But if you start to slow down, you're still going forward towards your destination, but you're going at a slower rate, that's called de uh, disinflation. But if you reverse and go backwards, that's called disinflation. So yes, maybe prices uh, are not increasing as much. So that's disinflation. But if you look at 2020 and many items, whether it's eggs, gasoline, electricity, new vehicles, it's all gone up by 17%, 24%, 44%, right? So that's where we feel this squeeze inherently as consumers. Now, aside, the, the yin and yang of inflation is something called shrinkflation. And that's a little more deceptive or maybe more insidious because you don't see it as much. And that's the idea of not prices changing, but volume changing. And for my grocery shoppers out there, we'll know this, I'll know this, that when I buy my favorite raisins, I'm getting 70 fewer per pack. It's still gonna cost me $3.80, but I'm getting less. For my toothpaste individuals, all of us, hopefully, uh, you're getting less in fluid ounces per toothpaste. Toilet paper, same thing, but you're spending the same amount. So you're like, ah, it must be the same value. It's not going up in price, but the volume's decreasing. Once again, it's a little tax on you. So I'll ask you these questions. These are all introspective questions. How much has your real estate increased if you own real estate? How much has your rent gone up in those areas that aren't rent controlled? 
How much the cost of gasoline increased? How much has your utility bill increased and your grocery bill? Okay, so the, the hallmark inflation in 2021 was 9%. Now we're looking at 3%. It's still gone up by 3%. But understand inflation is very individualistic. My basket of goods and services will differ from Destin's basket of goods and services. We're two different individuals, two different areas. We'll spend on different things. But it's likely all these things have likely gone up more than 5% and have likely gone up more than 9%. And that is a challenge. Now, answer me. This, so if you're, if you're gone up by 9%, you're like, okay, my parents always told me, my uncles always told me, my aunt has always told me, Robin, go save your money. Saving is the way we do it. That may have worked in the 1980s and the 1990s, right? In the 1980s and 90s, uh, early uh, 1990s, you're looking at mortgage rates typically between 17, 18%, quite expensive relative to what we are used to. Mind you, home prices were 50,000, 100,000, also quite depressed. And earning potential is probably 20 to 50,000. So they earn more, their affordability was better in terms of index. So if you take the, the saving approach right now and say, okay, I'm going to take my $10,000 and I'm going to save it. I don't want to invest it because it's too scary. I don't want to deal with it. I just want risk averse savings. So I'm going to put it into different banks. And these banks will pay you a certain amount because that's how fractional reserve banking works. It'll take your money and invest it outwards and they'll make the spread. But they're paying you 0.5% or they're paying you 1.25%, or they're gonna pay you the amount based on how much you, uh, you allocate towards them. So let's say they give you 2%, and we're saying inflation is 5%. Your real yield is negative 3%. It's taking the 5% inflation minus your savings rate, and that's what you're paying, right? You're losing purchasing power that way. So can we agree that our cost of living has increased? Has your income increased in step with your cost of living? And if it hasn't, you've unwillingly been taxed. Your purchasing power has eroded, has decreased. This is unless you own assets. And this might be a technical graph, so forgive me. But if you follow the blue line, the area under the curve there, that is the S&P 500. It's the Standard & Poor's top 500 largest companies in the U.S. And it's an index. Okay, And you can see at 2020, uh, I think it was March 13th or March 23rd, I'll get them confused. There's a 35% drop in that index investment. Then the orange line is the Federal Reserve, the semi-private or you call it private bank in the U.S. that governs monetary policy. You can see how much money they have on their balance sheet. And in response to that pandemic, they inflated their balance sheet by providing more stimulus. We had it here in Canada through CERB programs. We had it in the U.S. through stimulus checks. And their balance sheet increased. And guess what happened? They put more money in circulation, so your dollar is going to be worth less because it's less valuable. But guess where that money went? It went straight into asset prices. Look what happened to the blue line over the next two years. It shot up. Look where the S&P is right now. All-time highs. Maybe not today or yesterday, but historically in the last two weeks, all-time highs. Because there's been more money in the system and it has to go somewhere. So if you own an asset, guess what? Like a house, it's got more valuable in terms of dollar purchasing power, in terms of more dollars, but it's no more valuable in terms of the actual inherent good. This is a personal example. So if you look at the, um, the green line, that is my physiotherapy income. And it's in some self-employed, it's variable from year to year. Some years better than others, depending on how much vacation and uh, how busy I was. And the red line is my net worth, my assets minus my liabilities. And you can see I had a big dip in 2020. Here I was closed, the clinic was closed for three months. So I wasn't able to earn an income. Thankfully, I was in a position where I had a few assets to make up for my income. If my net worth was directly related to my income, it would drop down, right? I'd be kind of handcuffed to my profession. Fortunately, I was in a position where I had other assets that it went up to the right despite what my income did. And that's kind of, kind of becoming pandemic proof. And for us as healthcare professionals, and depending how you practice, we are stuck in two major kind of Two areas that we struggle with, we'll say. One is it's hard for us to earn income independent of our location. Usually we have to go to a physical location to earn an income. Here, I'm in the clinic right now. I had clients this morning. I have clients this afternoon. And number two, we have independent of time. We have to work on a certain time. If we're not working, we're not earning money traditionally, right? I have to be here from 8 to 7 today. That's where I earn money traditionally. But I can't earn money from 7 p.m. to 8 a.m. But if you own assets, you can't because they go up. Rental properties might go up. S&P might go up. So it's the idea of having these time-independent and location-independent revenue streams. 
Now, where do you spend your time? So these are eight different, uh, I think there's sorry, nine different areas where I've been fortunate enough to have income streams. This is based on last year. In 2023, I spent 1,300 hours in physiotherapy practicing. I spent about 400 hours building out this business. Then I spent a few running an Airbnb and then teaching at McMaster and a baking side hustle and down the stretch. For me, I say, okay, if I'm spending the most amount of time in my physiotherapy income, I expect my return on time to be the best there. So number one, two, three, this is where my time is spent. Tie between rental property one and rental property two. But here's the challenge for some of us. We only have one revenue source and we spend all our time there. But do we ever ask if that's the best return on our time? And allow me to show you this next graph. This is where my time is best spent monetarily, where I get the biggest return on my time. First one's my rental property, then dividends, then my other rental property, then my Airbnb, then trading stock options. And number six is where I spent six years of my life pursuing higher education, coming in number six in terms of the income streams. And that's a challenge because I invested all this time learning a profession, but it's not the best return of my time monetarily. It might be in terms of reward, but not monetarily. And then the other ones there was having that introspective look. Take home points. No one will care for your money as much as you will. That's the hard fact rule. You put your time for it. You put your sweat. You put your tears into it. No one's going to respect as much as you will. No one's going to have your best interests at heart as much as you will. I've had countless stories when I was younger where I miss, I mistrusted individuals to have their their my interests best for theirs. Where I spent lots of time uh, learning their processes or spent a lot of money investing with them, and they frankly didn't care as much as I did because they got paid either way. There's a lack of alignment. Think about your future self before you make decisions now. Because if you don't do it now, in 10 years time, will you regret not taking action now? And the answer is yes, then make the decision now. You're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna fail, and you're gonna learn. One of my favorite quotes, and it's on my, on my uh, phone, and it's on the board inside my, my main uh, living area, is fear kills more dreams than failure ever will. And it's the thought of failing that paralyzes us or leads to inaction. And not even so much the thought of us failing, it's the thought of what other people think about us failing that keeps us completely paralyzed. And I don't know why. It's, it's, it's hard to get over, but it's taking that action. And if you do not invest in yourself, who's going to do it for you? I don't want to end on a bad note, but it's, it's true. You have to take this and implore yourself to find resources to help you with this. And in saying that, uh, Jane is a great resource to understand how to kind of really solidify your clinical life. And then I'm happy to help. I run a business called Financially Fulfilled Physio. Uh, you can reach me through Instagram or through my website or through my email there. And in saying that, I'll end with the last joke, and this might be timely, is uh, where do fruits go on vacation? And if you pay attention next week on CNBC, the answer is Paris, where the Olympics are. Uh, and that, I will stop. Thank you so much, Robin. This was so great. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick time check for people. So we've hit about the 45 minute mark. So anyone that needs to jump off, feel free to do that. We're still going to keep recording. We're going to go through some Q&A now, but anyone that needs to drop off, will be sending the recording. While we're going through the Q&A, um, I'm going to get the team to pop up a little poll. We just love to get some feedback on the sessions um, as well. So someone from the team will launch that. It's a really quick poll. We'd love to hear your feedback. And while you're doing that, let's jump into some Q&A. So we definitely had some questions that we'd love to get to. Um, so one of the first ones that came up was in the chat asking for everyone, but I thought you might have some thoughts on this too, Robin, was um, do you have any recommendations for income or personal financials tracking programs or apps or tools? Uh, personal finance tracking. I think what you can look for is something called a net worth sheet into Google and a, a decent one. And I, I'm happy to share mine with you because you can download it. It'll, it'll track your, your assets, things that put money into your pocket. And that might be your brokerage accounts in terms of where you invest with Charles Schwab or Well Simple. It might be your checking account. It might be your rental property. It might be any sort of jeweler you have. And that's your assets. You can track that. Okay. And that could be more manual in terms of, oh, I know I have three rings here. You can't really put that online, but you know that you have that. And then you have your, your liabilities, things that take money out of your pocket. Oh, where are my loans? Credit card loan number one, number two, number three. And then I have X amount of payments, then you do the difference saying, okay, here's my assets minus my liabilities, my net worth is X amount. And you can uh, filter that back and forth throughout the months. I do mine every month. So I know where my assets are immediately every month. 
So if I were to pass away, I can give it to my partner and say, look, this is where things are. This is how much I own. This is how you can access them. Awesome. And then speaking of income, so Tabitha asked, when you when including income, do you also include the side hustles or are you saying not to include it if it's not steady income? I'd say if it's within like six months of the 12 months, so 50% of the time that you can rely upon it, then I would include it. If it's a one-off thing that you do a bake sale every Easter season, we'll say, I wouldn't put that in a monthly income because it's it's quite variable. So I'd say mm -hmm. within six months that you can spread it out, then I'd include that definitely. Be conservative, right? Be conservative because having extra money is always nice to have, but budging too much and not having enough, think, ah, then I kind of kind of screwed myself a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then Hannah asked um, a sort of a more like program tool question. And we've had this question in some other sessions, but I was curious if you had any recommendations. So how do you organize your bookkeeping? For example, save and organize receipts to make things easier during tax season. I love this question because I used to be quite allergic to technology being an older person here. My accountant really helped me with this. So I have a software and it's called HubDoc. But every time I have a receipt, let's say I'm going out for dinner with Katie, I'll take a picture of that receipt. That uh, software will read the receipt and say, oh, Rook, Robin, you're at Kelsey's. That must be meals and entertainment for X, Y, and Z. And I can say yes or no. If I say yes, then it's auto-generated to my accounting software. And then my accountant, Kevin, say, okay, look, Robin, July 18th, you went for dinner. We call that meals and expenses. Boom, it's done for me. Then it's also all digital. So I don't need to carry a shoebox at the end of the year to Kevin. I can just show him that he has access to and he can read that. So if I ever get audited, guess what? It's all there verified. That's great. And then I think this kind of fits in that same space a little bit. So someone said they're starting a private practice in August, not incorporated. Do you recommend getting a business credit card bank account? I'm always a big fan of tying things paper trail wise immediately. So for me, I have accounts for each one of my businesses and they're all separate and they do not co-mingle. So yes, I would be in, in the camp of saying if it's business, have a credit card, have a checking account, having a saving account, different login here versus my personal. Perfect. Um, and then I, I like this one. I think this, you touched on this a little bit, but Nate asked, uh, it's for a question around fee setting strategies and overcoming money deservingness. So I think overcoming some of those like blockers when you're trying to like increase your fees and, and how do you, how do you approach that? It, it is, it is challenging because I think a lot of us get into healthcare because we like to help people and reward people with our services. And oftentimes you weigh between providing us a, a service or providing a I'm not going to use it lightly, but a charity, right? You feel like you're doing that and you might feel like you're not including people, but you have a very uh, integral service you provide and that's improving people's lives. You cannot diminish or dilute that value. So when you do increase your rates, you're charging more for a service. Those individuals who value your time and your effort and the amount of time you invested in your education will come and pursue your services. Those under individuals will not do it. And it's being okay with that. And that might come with time. That might come with rejection. But it's important that I, I think you value your services and maybe filter or weed in or out people who do not find value in your services. Awesome. And then in the chat, there was quite a few people talking about, I'm not sure if you're super familiar with it, but you need a budget, Y-N-A-B. Are you familiar? Um, I just saw lots of people talking about it, recommending it. So I just wanted to like, give you a chance to chat about it too, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a great system. There's a paid version and um, an all, an, a paid or free version. I, I'm kind of old school. I'll use my own uh, spreadsheet because I've created it. I know how to do it and I've done it um, for years now, but it's very similar and it kind of really makes it artistically quite appealing that you can track your finances pretty well there on a monthly basis. And it takes some of the guessing games out of it too. So I, yeah, big fan of it. Don't use it personally, but I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple of people sharing some resources like podcasts and books. And I'm curious if you have any, any podcasts or books or things that you, that you love to, to stay up to speed on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think if you're a beginner, I think two books are formidable in my career was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, and uh, The Wealthy Barber by David Chilton. It just talks about how money works and how to really save for the future. And then podcasts, I think what might be what resonate well with the audience is something called Millennial Investing by the Investor Network, or the Investor Podcast. And they break down, I think many of us are in the same age group, uh, what money is, how to allocate it in a way that's not too boring like our parents talk about it maybe. 
That was that. So there's a few outstanding questions in the q and I wonder if you want to take a peek, Robin, because some of these are more like specific to you and how you do things. And so I just want to see if there's any that you want to answer or any that you might have like resources to direct people to. So I just wanted to give you a chance to sort of read through those or if there's some that are maybe like a little too complicated to answer, answer live. So I would love to you to take a peek. Sure. Yes. I think Lori asked, where did you get the 7%? And 7% is what I use historically. If you've looked at the uh, the last, let's say, 100 years for the S&P 500, the S&P 500 will return between 8 to 11% net of fees in a year. Funny enough, if you look at the actual um, the returns, it's rarely actually 8% a year. Some years it's 20%, and some years it's negative 3%, but it averages out to 8 to 11%. So I use 7 as a conservative value for that. Uh, what is my opinion on CNBC Invested Pro Club? Is it worth the money? I don't know anything about the CNBC Invested Pro Club, but I'm a big proponent of spending money um, to invest in yourself. And for me, if I'm not sure about the program, I'll look at reviews. I will do it for a month, see if there's a month back guarantee before I commit to it, but I'm a big fan of investing in yourself. Um, physio income. Ah, yes. So on a physio income, how are dividends your number one income? It's not my number one absolute income. It is the number one return on time income. So for me to invest in the dividend stocks, it takes me two seconds on a phone, type it in, place it there. I don't check it for the year. But if it goes up in value, let's say $100, and for that minute I spent there, that is the best return of my time because I'm not investing my time in doing it. Whereas my therapy income, I'm there every single 30 minutes with a client. I only get a certain amount, but I implore a lot more time there. That's why it's diluted relative to other sources. It's not the absolute value, it's the relative value. So I think we probably have time for one more question, just because we want to make sure we're mindful of your time and everyone else's time. So if you have one more you want to answer, and then as I said earlier, we'll do um, our best to make sure that we find opportunities to answer the rest of the questions in other areas. And as Robin said, you can reach out to him. He's also in the Jane community. You can find him um, and tag him at Financially Fulfilled Physio in there as well. But yeah, one more question if you want. Thank you, Dustin. And I'll, this is a quick one. That's why I chose it. So thank you, Hannah. What are the categories for expenses? There are fixed things that don't change from month to month. There are semi-variable that change every couple months based on, depending on the season. And then there's variable that's all seasonal. Like think about your um, holiday shopping. It only happens for six weeks of the year generally. So that's your semi-variable. So fixed, uh, semi-variable, and variable expenses. And that is it. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week. And we will see you again for another session soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.